Thank you. So the title is already pronounced. Actually, if you look at the web page of the Institute, uh, the word pseudorandom is written in some quite peculiar form, PSDUEO, which is pretty good scrambling for such a notion. So there's some randomness in the notion of pseudorandom graphs. OK, so let me start with an informal statement, what I'm going to talk about, and then I will explain uh, uh, details of it, or some details of it. So in informally, What I will be trying to prove is that if you take uh, a pseudorandom graph, G has the right number of Hamilton cycles. And you need some scaling, so let me put it in a somewhat cautious form if scale appropriately. What you scale is, of course, not the graph, but rather the number. And of course, I need say, to explain some notions here. So what is to be explained or specified? There are several things. I need to tell you which notion of pseudonym graphs I'll be using. And actually, not all notions are amenable for this uh, count of pseudorandom graphs. Now, I need to explain you what is the right number, what should we expect. And I need also to explain you what is a, a, a appropriate scale. Of course, if you take enough logs of any quantity, you get what you expect. But uh, the question is, how many logs do you need to take? OK, so let me s start going by this notion slowly and explain uh, what exactly I mean. OK, so let's start with a right number. So I won't define the yet notion of epsilon random graph, but basically epsilon random graph is a graph which is similar to a random graph. And therefore, we expect its counts, like a number of Hamilton cycles and some other counts, to be pretty similar. and therefore. The first notion to look at is to look at random graphs and to see what situations there. Okay, so we need to explore number of Hamilton cycles in random graphs. So let me introduce the notion. So uh, notation, I will denote by H of G the number of Hamilton cycles, which I also abbreviate by HC in G. OK, so uh, we won't be really looking at uh, random graphs, but we will be looking at random graphs just as a benchmark for comparison. So I'll uh, mention you two probability space of random graphs, GNP and GNM. So random graphs. The first notion is GNP. The vertex set is 1 up to n, and every pair ij is an edge with probability p, which may be a function of n. And this choice is done independently of any other pair. So the other notion is g and m. So there. The probability space is composed, let me know, by omega of all graphs with vertex set 1 up to n. So those are graphs on n vertices, and they have exactly m edges. And we endow it with a uniform probability measure. So the probability of a graph g is exactly 1 over the size of the universe, which is 1 over n choose 2 choose. OK, and we won't be dwelling much into it, but uh, informally we can say that GNP and GNM are pretty similar to each other if you tune the parameters in the right way. So when, let's say, you take your M to be appro approximately equal to the expected number of edges in GNP, which is N choose 2 times P. Okay. 
And therefore, you, expect, you can expect a lot of things to happen simultaneously with high probability, both in GMP and in GMP. Now, let's look at the count. So, so how many parameter cycles do you expect? Yeah, we can look at random regular graph as well. So we expect uh, it's even harder probability space to work is because, if, for example, in GNP and GNM, some results are known. Some pretty good result about the number of gamma metal cycles, distributions, etc. For G and Z, there is, of course, some knowledge. Uh, it's it's uh, more developed, actually, for smaller values of D. For example, for constant D, we know more than for grow and Z. But uh, uh, the point is that I actually I need some benchmark, and uh, be my benchmark is GNP and GNM. We can as well think about G and Z, and expect the same things, to, same things to happen. But actually, the result will be entirely deterministic. I will say that every pseudo random graph with such and such properties has the right number of edges. Okay, so in the complete graph on n vertices, we have n factorial orderings of vertices. Each of them gives a cycle. And each cycle is produced in two n ways, two for the direction and n for the starting point. And therefore, altogether, we get n minus 1 factorial divided by two Hamilton cycles. And therefore, we can co compute the expectation due to linearity of the number of Hamilton cycles in G and P and G and M. So let's look at the random variable x, which is the number of Hamilton cycles in my graph. So in G and P, we have the expectation of x to be the number of Hamilton cycles in Km, which is n minus 1 factorial divided by 2 times p to the n. The n edges altogether, you need to pay probability p for each. So that's the expectation. In G and M, uh, we have, again, by the same linearity of expectation, n minus 1 factorial uh, divided by 2. And then we need to multiply it by n choose 2 minus m choose m minus n, divided by n choose 2, choose m. And actually, these uh, expressions behave more or less the same way if you take your uh, m here to be n choose 2p. So that's what we expect. Now, what's known about this quantity? Okay. What is known? So it turns out that the question is uh, uh, certainly not entirely trivial, maybe not trivial at all. It's easy to compute the expectation. It's uh, harder. It's still feasible. But it's harder to compute the variance and to compute the limiting distribution. But still, for some ranges, the results are known. In particular, there is a paper of Janssen from 94, where he looks at G and P and G and M, and looks at several gra graph counts, uh, number of perfect matchings, number of spanning trees, number of Hamilton cycles, and derives uh, relatively accurate results about this. So let me just, as a benchmark, state what we have here. So let's look at G and M. So G and M has, has several regimes, so let me mention just one of them. So let's say that if your M is much larger than N to the power C halves, his result about relatively dense graphs only. And for technical reasons, you need to assume that m is not too close to the total number of edges, uh, which is n choose 2. So n choose 2 minus m should be much larger than linear, if I remember right. Then we have the following thing. So the expectation of x, x is as before number of Hamilton cycles. It's n minus 1 factorial as it asymptotically check, actually p to the n, where p is said to be m divided by n choose 2. And for the variance, I, I don't remember by heart the exact expression, so I will copy it from my paper. So the variance behaves like m cubed divided by m squared which is a, a negligible term if m is large enough, as we assumed it to be. And then 1 minus p squared times the expectation of x squared. Okay. So you see that the variance is in this regime is smaller than the square of expectation. Therefore, the random variable is concentrated. And most of the time, it's close to the expectation. Actually, he proves also that also x, when standardized, is 
distributed normally. Okay, so basically what we expect to happen happens indeed for in this model GNP. So in G, in G, sorry, in G and M. In GNP, the picture is somewhat different. It shows us that the problem is not as straightforward as you may expect it to be. So we know the expectation. The expectation of x is exactly n minus 1 factorial divided by 2 times p to the n. But here, the, the linear distribution is rather, instead of being normal, it's log normal, which means that we have pretty heavy distribution of tails. So x is log normal. So to be more specific, what he proves is the following statement. So p to the half log x minus log of the expectation of x plus 1 minus p divided by p. So that's the right normalization. It goes asymptotically to normal with uh, parameters 0 and 2 times 1 minus pi. The exact numbers are not really important here. There are two messages here. To begin with, the distribution of the number Hamilton cycles is not as simple as we expect it to be. It's, for example, it's not normal. It's rather no log normal. The other message from it, you see there is a correction factor here, which says that actually most of the time, the number of Hamilton cycles is below its expectation. Okay, so most of the time, so x is much, much smaller than its expectation. Uh, uh, sure. So what this is saying intuitively is that the number of Hamiltonian cycles is growing exponentially with the number of edges. And since you have small variation, the, the variation in the edges is big enough. Uh, correct. So, so basically, it says us that uh, roughly what happens is what we expect to happen, up to some corrections. And there are some reasons for corrections here, because without those corrections, it's not true. And indeed, the number grows as the graph becomes denser and denser. And uh, it may not be not exactly what you, you expect to happen. Okay. So that's uh, the moral of the story. OK, so that's the result of uh, uh, Janssen. And I think he also knows to, to go a bit, uh, a, a bit down to smaller values of m. But for example, he shows that if you assume your m to be of order n to the power of three halves, the result is no longer true. The limiting distribution is something different. So basically, what is uh, expected to happen happens indeed, but you are in for some surprises, and sometimes you need to put some correction terms. So basically, here I'm preparing the ground for my correction terms. There will be some correction terms here, which I will try to swallow under main terms by taking logs. His explanation, I don't, uh, well, uh, I'm not sure he gives some explanation. What you can expect is a so-called jackpot phenomena. Because here the number of edges is not rigid, it's GNP. So once in a while, with a relatively small probability, you get uh, a larger number of Hamilton cycles, a larger number of edges. And this larger number of, of, of edges, because the counts are really huge, the counts are exponential, may drive the number of Hamilton cycles uh, 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 relatively far from expectation. So that's ki kind of plausible explanation. Yeah, so in, 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 another, in another reason, maybe so, if, if you can buy yourself uh, some extra edges, pay in some exponential small price, maybe you can uh, plug in some structure and increase the number of Hamiltonian cycles quite substantially. For example, if you, if you compare these results here, it turns out that in GNM the picture is much cleaner than in GNP, because, for example, the variance is smaller. So one of the sources of, variances, of variance in GNP is the number of edges, apparently, from this result. Okay, uh, so another thing which I should have mentioned earlier is uh, a very legitimate question, when does it start? So when does the first Hamilton cycle appear in GNP or GNM? So that's a very classical question in random graph theory, and it has been answered pretty fully in the 80s, so Aitai, Komlosh, and Semerdi in 83, and independently Bolobosh in 84, proved the following results. So like, if you look at GNP, and if you take your P to be 
log n פלוס לוג לוג n פלוס אומגה פאן, ואומגה פאן will be my notation for any function tending to infinity arbitrary slowly. אומגה of f is a function g such that the ratio g over f tends to infinity divided by n, then almost surely, which is usually abbreviated by s, which means this probability tending to 1 as uh, n tends to infinity, g n p is Hamiltonian. So that's the result for GNP, and for GNM, they have a very similar result, which again shows you the usual similarity between GNP and GNM. So if in GNM you take your M to be the same expression, log N plus log, log N plus omega of 1 divided by N and multiplied by N choose 2, which means the expected number of edges here is exactly the value of M here, then almost surely G and M is Hamiltonian. Yeah, by the way, here I use G and P and G and M for both the probability space and for a random graph sampled from this probability space. Uh, I have a question about Yanko's results. Uh -huh. So uh, if you know that in the G and M model that uh, you know, X is normally distributed, mm -hmm. then doesn't this tell you something about what you should expect for the G and P model? So um, Well, so once you take GNP and condition on the number of edges, you, you exactly get GNM. I mean, you should, I mean, this jackpot phenomenon should just be a convolution of a varying variance gauss. Uh, correct. I don't, I, yeah, I don't know what exactly is his method for proving. Uh, so I think uh, mass sign it say it's, it's the proof is by projection and decomposition method. So if you know what is it. So, no, but good. I'm asking you about the black box result. I mean, you yeah. know the result for GNP. Okay. You can do, yeah, I, I think you, you can derive, well, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, probably not in this degree of precision. You won't be able, I guess, to, to, to figure out the limiting distribution, but to say that uh, in some uh, well-defined sense in GNP, the number is concentrated in the around the ex expectation, you'll be able to do it. And actually, maybe it's even more legitimate to say that normally, if you take GNP, the number of edges is around its expectation, and if you need, if you condition the number of edges being around its expectation, that's what you get. Right, but I'm saying also for, I mean, uh -huh. all sorts of other graph properties, if you had a normal as the limiting distribution for GNM, mm -hmm. then, and you had, you know, that you increase appropriately with the number of edges, mm -hmm. then you would still get something which is not a normal for the GNP graph. You mean like some, some kind of a general phenomenon? Yeah. You, I mean, uh, maybe a... a Maybe I'm not I'm, I'm, Yeah, I'm, I'm actually asking this to figure out what scaling one would need between the variance. You know, so I think so maybe it's not entirely trivial. For example, here there is this correction factor, and it's not clear that you'll be able to derive it by looking only upon GNM, correct? I mean, it is true that in principle, that if you know what happens for GNM, you get this complete expression. Yeah, and you know, yes, you can yes, compute yes, what Sure, happens. correct. Yeah, 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 because the GNP is a decomposition into GNM with uh, appropriate probabilities for M. That's correct. Yeah, so in, in some sense, as usual, again, if, in, if, if you have good knowledge about one of the models, you can use it to derive a, a reasonably good knowledge for the other. That's what it says. But basically, uh, the, the quantitative results are not that important. What's important is that in both GNM and GNP, what you expect to happen happens indeed, and maybe you need some correction terms. Maybe the number of Hamilton cycles is, uh, is not normal, but rather than some even exponential large correction, which are still small compared to the expectation. So that's the message. OK, and actually, going back to this result, so this result is optimal, uh, as easy to see, because if you flip here the sign from plus to minus, then not only you don't have Hamiltonicity, you get a vertex of degree 1 or less, almost surely. And therefore, there is no Hamiltonicity. Okay. So if you compare Janssen to, to this result, so Hamiltonian cycle appears much, much earlier than the result of Janssen. Okay. Good. Okay, so let's go back to, sure. Yep. The number of Hamiltonian cycles, even for random graphs in GNP, has a big variance. 
correct. Yeah, correct. In some sense, I'm, I'm trying, well, I don't know how successfully, to, to supply me with some excuse about formulating results about pseudonym graph, which will be relatively precise. There will be some pretty hefty correction term. And in some sense, this correction term, not exactly unavoidable, but even, even if you take this innocent space like GNP and, and try to figure out what's going on there, even there, there is some fuzziness in, in the limiting distribution. OK, good. So let me cover uh, some other previous relevant results. So another real result which is relevant is the result of Alan Fries from 2000. So he looks at the number of Hamilton cycles in dense pseudorandom graphs. Now, what's his definition of dense? So basically, he looks at the case. So there are two parameters, d and epsilon. d is basically the degree and epsilon the error. And he requires its graph, uh, the graph to, uh, to satisfy the following restrictions. Uh, all degrees, the graph is on n vertices. And so all degrees um, d of v is equal to d1 plus minus epsilon, which means up to epsilon uh, relative corrections, all degrees are equal to d. And uh, he also requires that for every two sets s and t, which are not that small, they are at least epsilon n in size, the number of edges between s and t is what you expect to be. And what you expect it to be is d over, I will discuss it uh, in more details later, but normally if you take a random graph whose degrees are around d, you the density is d over n. And therefore, you expect around d over n times s times t edges between every two sets of sizes in c. And that's indeed what he requires. And he wants this error to be at most, let's say, epsilon s times t. Yeah, so uh, because I'm, I will be talking about the case, or he is talking about the case of uh, d, which is linear n, so I, can, I don't need to, to, to scale it with d. So I put it this way. Okay. And then the statement is, so. So the result is if g is as above, and if d is linear in n, then h of g behaves asymptotically like n factorial d over n to, to the n. That's what we expect for the random graph is the same density, up to some polynomial terms again. And then there's an error term, which I will write in the form 1 plus little of fun. And I put here epsilon to the n. Yeah, so if your epsilon is small, there is a, a correction. A correction may be exponential in n, but is still. The n, in uh, the n is, is in which exponent? The n is here. Oh, that's order one. Yeah, that's little of one. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, or you can write it. Uh, alternative form is 2 to the power little of n. And little of n. There, there, there is some uh, constant which depends on epsilon. So that's the result. And actually, in this in degree of fuzziness, because degrees are not exactly d, but around z, and the number of edges is around what we expect to be, there should be some correction. And the correction he gets is indeed uh, exponential. But the exponent, this exponent is much smaller than this exponent. OK, so another relevant result is by uh, Cutler and Jeff Kahn from 2009, which is Really strikingly beautiful result, and it says the following thing. So suppose we take a graph G, any graph, not necessarily epsilon random, anything. So a graph G on n vertices, and we know that its minimal degree is at least n over 2. So everyone, or more or less everyone, knows that uh, this condition alone guarantees the existence of at least one Hamilton cycle. Okay, and, and for this reason, this graph is called Dirac graph. Because this is exactly the contents of the theorem of Dirac, saying that if any graph on n vertices with uh, all degrees at least n over 2 has at least one Hamilton cycle. Now, what Jeff proves is that in this case, not only you have one Hamilton cycle, you have plenty of them. So the number of Hamilton cycles is at least as large as n factorial. 
times one half to the n. So one half a corresponds to this bound on the minimal degree, and then there is an error term, one plus little of one to the n. <coughs> one minus little of one we can write here. Okay, that's one result which says that if your graph is dense enough, you have a lot of Hamilton cycles. And in some sense, the random graph is, is uh, the worst example. And actually, what he proves is the second result of this about, uh, um, actually, another formulation of, of the result is the following statement. Not only you can prove it for a graph with minimal degree d, but if you assume that all degrees are the same and are equal to d, and this should be at least n over 2, because otherwise you don't have, you may not have a single Hamilton cycle. So if g plus, if g is d regular, and d is, again, at least n over 2, then the number of Hamilton cycles is not only at least, but also at most. Okay? So the number of Hamilton cycles in g is equal to n factorial, d over n to the n times 1 plus little of 1 to the n. Correct. Uh, uh, follows the upper bound. Uh, the upper bound follows from means. Correct. Yes. For the lower bound, you still need to struggle, correct? Yeah, and, and as you will see, so in my result also, the upper bound follows relatively pretty easily. And what's really interesting is the lower bound to prove that you have a lot of them. Okay. But Okay, so that's basically the background. Okay, now I, I need to define you some notion of pseudo-random graphs, and for this, I will be using the so-called notion of N D lambda graphs. Okay, so as I said, not every notion of pseudo-randomness is good here. For example, there are some weak notion of pseudo-randomness saying that if uh, the number of edges, if the edge distribution is approximately right, then the graph is pseudo-random. So this is no good here because, for example, this notion would allow for isolated vertices, and therefore you don't have any uh, uh, Hamilton cycles at all. So I need some more rigid notion, and the notion I'll be using because basically because it's convenient. There's nothing uh, uh, particular about it apart from a pretty good handle on degrees and edge distribution. So this is a notion of Andy lambda graphs. Any secrets for regular graphs here in Newtonian, even if the minimum degree is like, uh, No. No, no, you can have two, two different clicks, correct, of size and over two. You need uh, connectivity, maybe. Correct, so, yeah. Connected and regular, maybe. It's uh, Jackson, I think, correct? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit lower, yeah. Correct. Okay, so and the lambda graph. So what are they? So let me remind you the notion of the adjacency matrix. So suppose we have a graph G whose vertex set is n, and 1 up to n, and h set e. So we define a matrix A will be n by n real matrix, or actually 0, 1 matrix, which is defined as follows. So A i j is equal to 1 if i j is an h of j and equal to 0 otherwise. So what you get is, uh, a real symmetric matrix. And therefore, it has a full spectrum of real eigenvalues. And it's customary to denote them by lambda 1 up to lambda n and, by, and to order them in the non increasing order. So those are lambda 1 up to lambda n. Those are eigenvalues of A, which are also customary called eigenvalues of the graph. G itself. So that's the picture. Now, what do we know about eigenvalues? So there are uh, a couple of basic facts, so which are pretty trivial. So the first one is uh, all eigenvalues are at most the maximum degree of the graph in the absolute values. Okay. And the second is is if G is D regular, then it's pretty easy to see that lambda 1 is equal to d, exactly. Okay. So basically, if you have a d regular graph, all action, all spectrum sits between minus d and d. Okay. Okay. And this stuff gives us a reason for the following definition. So now we define the notion of an nd lambda graph. Okay. 
So here's the definition. So G is an N D lambda graph. So N D lambda is uh, three parameters. If the following three properties hold, the first one is V of G has cardinality N. The graph has exactly N vertices. Second is G is D regular, which is a drawback of this notion because we require our graphs to be exactly regular. You can uh, uh, flex it a bit, but uh, there are some limitations to it. And the third most important property is that for every i between 2 and n, which means for every non-trivial eigenvalue, there is a trivial eigenvalue of d, or the rest is somewhere between minus d and d. So for every i between 2 and n, we require that the absolute value of lambda i is at most lambda. Well, saying it differently, you can write that the maximal of lambda 2 and absolute value of lambda n is at most lambda. So this is the notion. So basically, it's quite easy to check whether your graph is an n lambda graph. You, you need to have it regular. But once you have it regular, you write down its adjacency system matrix. You compute its eigenvalues. And if all eigenvalues are at most lambda, then you are in business. You get an n lambda graph. Now, what's good about them? About and the lambda graphs. Actually, there's a lot of good things about it. I think quite a few people in this audience have written a lot of things about uh, uh, these or similar notions of pseudorandomness. So, what I will need is the so called expander Nixon lemma. which is actually a, a relatively easy statement. And it says as follows. So suppose we have a graph G, which is an N D lambda graph. Now, what I'm going to write is a deterministic statement. In, is, it's not that you like a sample a graph or you sample uh, some set, uh, sets of vertices. It's for any N D lambda graph and for any subset. Then for any two sets S and C, in N, not necessarily disjoint. We look at the number of edges between S and C. And the number of edges, I count edges with one end point in S and then another point in C. For example, if S is equal to T, every edge is counted twice. OK, so the number of edges in between S and C is what you expect to be. Now, what you expect to be, the graph is of degree D, which means of density D over N. And therefore, what you expect to have is D over N times cardinality of s times cardinality of t. So this will be, would be the ideal situation. So in the real situation, you cannot uh, require this. There will be always some deviations. So in this case of n lambda graphs, we know to bound the deviation by, at most, lambda square root s times t. So which basically uh, anything you need to know about and the lambda graphs for my result, the only thing we need to know is edge distribution. Now, what, is, what it says us? It, it says us that if you have an n lambda graph, and if lambda is relatively small, then between any two pair of sets S and C, the number of edges is about the right one, up to error estimate. Okay. Now, for our purposes, what we will derive is uh, uh, the following conclusions. So basically, we can say, if you just play with this formula, so I, I don't write it in a very formal way, so, but we can say that small sets expand outside by the factor of about d squared over lambda squared. So this happens if you play with this formula and you see what's the number of edges between the set and uh, the rest of the graph. And uh, they always exist at least one edge between every two large sets. You need to specify what's small, what large is, but the basic is the paradigm is that small sets expands, expand a lot. And if, sets are, if your sets are large enough, 
There is an edge between every two large sets, right? As follows easily from here. Because the other thing is, as I said, the, of course, it follows from here that the smaller lambda is the better as you station. You can ask how small can lambda be, and lambda, in some sense, unfortunately, can be only as small as square root of d as the result of Noga and Ravi Bopana, correct? Yeah, well, we, uh, you know, in this talk, we are in such degree of in, in precision <laughs> that we don't care about multiplicative constant. The square root of the correct, yeah, uh, correct, correct. Yeah, but yeah, this is good enough for us. Yeah. <coughs> OK, very good. Now, so what we'll be doing, we'll be basically discussing Hamiltonicity in and the lambda graphs. So basically, the statement we would like to prove is, suppose we have an ND lambda graph, so we need to impose some restrictions on ND and lambda, maybe on the ratio, or ratio of D and lambda. By the way, I should have said that the ratio of D over lambda is, co is the so-called spectral ratio of the graph. And the larger the spectral ratio is, the better our graph, the closer it is to resemble an, uh, an ideal edge distribution, as you see from here. OK, so the result uh, would be that if you have an ND lambda graph, and if you impose some additional restrictions on ND and lambda, then you have a lot of Hamilton cycles. Well, to begin with, who says there is one Hamilton cycle in such a graph? So actually, I know who says it. So with Benny Sulakov, we have the following result in 2003. So we will look at the ND lambda graph, so you need your N to be large enough, so n is larger than uh, some uh, unspecified constant. And if you have g, which is an n d lambda graph, and if you require that the ratio d of a lambda is at least as large as, say, log n, so all my logs are natural, then g is Hamiltonian. So that's the result, actually, well, this is a translation of this result from some kind of Hungarian, because uh, there are some, a lot of extra logs and log logs and log log logs here, so in order to make it simpler. And actually, the, uh, these logs are in our favor. So actually, the ratio we require is somewhat smaller than log n. But in this simple form, it's good enough. Okay. So if the spectral ratio d over lambda is at least as large as log n, which is relatively my requirement, then a graph is Hamiltonian. So every ND lambda graph whose spectral ratio is at least log n is already Hamiltonian. And this is actually related to a very nice conjecture of Havatel about toughness. So the conjecture we put on our paper is the following one. So maybe the conjecture is even more interesting than the result. So the conjecture from the same paper says that they exist an absolute constant C such that for any graph G, which is n d lambda graph, if the spectral ratio d over lambda is at least as large as this constant C, then G is Hamiltonian. Yeah, and actually, for those who know, so this conjecture would follow from a probably a much more known conjecture of Havatel about toughness, which says that if, if a graph is tough enough, whatever it means, then the graph is Hamiltonian. And actually, it's quite easy to see that if the spectral ratio is large, then the toughness of the graph is large as well, and therefore yeah, the graph is Hamiltonian. So I think there are much more reasons to believe in, the, in this conjecture, because uh, here you really have a very good grip on the graph. And actually, I think at some point it was believed that Havatel toughness conjecture is, is, is correct for even very small numbers. One, one tough graph is uh, Hamiltonian, which is, uh, turned out to be untrue. So there you, you may have some surprises here. I, am, I pretty firmly believe in this conjecture. Also, one toughness would imply uh, two things, one and two things. Uh, well, it, 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 at any rate, it's not true. Yeah, it's, yeah, uh, I mean, Yes, yes. Uh, no, wait, no. There should be, I think, one. I think it was two. Yeah, I think it was two. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's not clear what the original was. It's, uh, I think it's really possible. Yeah, some, yeah. It's some. Really possible. Yeah, correct. So, yeah, but. Uh, the other uh, well, you know, so may maybe we should check so what's exactly in the paper. Maybe it's actually not in the church as a paper, or maybe he just asks the question. Yeah. Uh -huh. I see. I see. Uh, okay. Well, I see. Well, you know, some, sometimes people co uh, conjecture nice, but uh, false conjectures. <laughs> Good. Okay. Uh, now, what's the technique for proving our result? Because I will need it in my result. So the basic technique is so-called a, a rotation extension technique. Developed by Porsche in 76. Okay, so how does it go? So let me explain you a bit briefly. So suppose we have a graph G. And let's assume it's connected, because it's probably, probably a mild assumption about it. And suppose you have a path in your graph. So P0 is a path of length L, V0 up to VL, pass in G. And ideally, you would like to close this path into Hamilton cycle. So maybe you don't, don't do it in one chart, but you want uh, normally to turn it, either to close it to a cycle and to, to hope this cycle is Hamiltonian, or to find the longer path. So if you repeat it uh, enough times, Eventually, you will get Hamilton cycle. So this would be the idea. So suppose we have a pass. So here's the pass, v not up to the L. And suppose we are so lucky that the, the edge v not v L is in the graph as well. So if v not v L is in the graph G, then actually what we have is not only a pass but a cycle in the same set of vertices. So here's a cycle. See, and either the cycle is Hamiltonian, which means it covers all vertices. If it's, not, if it's not such, then there is something outside. The graph is connected. There will be an edge sticking outside. And therefore, you'll be able to uh, switch from the pass P0 to a longer, by at least one vertex pass, like this. You go around the cycle, and you stop at the next to the last vertex. So you get one, one vertex more. So this is called rotation, uh, so, sorry, extension step. So either you get a cycle, this cycle is Hamiltonian, or you can extend it to a longer pass. Okay. Suppose this is not the case, but there are some edges in the graph. So let's look at the edges, at other edges sticking out of VL. So suppose we know that VL U is an edge of our graph. So here's a pass, V0, VL. And this is another edge touching VL. So if this U is outside, okay, then the station is pretty easy, U, then you get a longer pass. So you can think about, this, about it as extension again. OK, so the, the other case, if this edge U is inside the pass, OK? So if u belongs to v, you know, say u is equal to some vertex i, and i is anywhere between 2 and l minus, between 1 actually, and l minus 2. Okay, there is an edge going from the end vl somewhere to the middle of your cycle, vi, of your path. Then you can rotate, so that's, that's the rotation part, so what you do is the following, so that's your original path p note. And now you can create a pink, whatever, pass as follows. You go with the original pass up to the i, then you jump to the l, and then you go almost all the way back to the i plus one. Okay. So the i plus one. So that's a rotation. You rotate one end point, and you get a new pass, p1. So you get p1. V of P1 on the same set of vertices. V of P1 is exactly equal to V of P0. So once you get a pass, you can rotate it again. And the hope is that after a number of rotations, if you rotate enough, then they will be either you will be able to close your current pass to a cycle, or there will be an edge sticking outside. 
So that's the idea. So that's the rotation part and that's the expansion part of the technique. Okay, and what we need for our result is the following adaptation of uh, our paper with Benny, and it says as follows, lemma. It's literally, it's not there, but if you work the numbers, you, you can get it from there rather easily. So it goes like this. So uh, for every positive epsilon, there exists large enough constant C and and not, so the life starts from graphs uh, with uh, enough vertices, so that the following holds, such that. Suppose we have a graph G, and this graph G is M G lambda graph. M is at least as large as M not. And the ratio G over lambda is not as in our result, but uh, we ask for a bit more, it's log M to the power of one plus epsilon. So instead of requiring it being merely log n, here we require it to be a bit large. Now, what are the consequences? The consequences are as follows. Well, to begin with, and that's pretty easy to prove, and you need actually much uh, lower bound on the spectral ratio. So to begin with, g is connected. And therefore, you can play this game with rotation and extension. Now, more importantly, the following holds. So suppose you have a pass, any pass P0, pass in G. Then the claim will be, so for any P0 pass in G, there exists a pass, let's say P star, pass in G, connects in two points A and B in the vertex set of G, such that the following holds. So they have the same vertex set, meaning one of them is obtained after a series of rotation from the other. So V of P star is exactly equal to V of P naught. So we rotate and stay in place. Second is we don't perform that many rotations. Namely, if you look at the symmetric difference of the number of edges, E of P star and E of P naught, so if you rotate, some edges go in and some edges go out, of course. But if you rotate, for example, one rotation costs you one edge going in and one edge going out. And therefore, basically, by saying what's the symmetric difference, I'm saying what's the number of rotations required to go from P0 to P star. Okay. So this will be at most uh, C log n divided by log of D over lambda. Okay. And those rotations bring you something good. And something good is the following thing. So so either the H A B is in your graph, and then you close it to a cycle, and then you can extend it further, or G has an edge between A B and the outside world, which is V of G minus V of P naught. In which case you can extend this well. So basically, what we are saying the following thing. If our graph is, large, is, is good enough, it's uh, uh, n the lambda graph is large enough spectral ratio, then to begin with, it's connected. And not only that, for any pass you take, no matter how long or how short it is, after rotating at relatively limited number of times, you arrive to a new pass. Uh, P star and this P star is already be good because you can close it to a cycle. That's one option. Or the other option, you can go outside and extend it to another vertex. So, uh, why should we care? We will see, because actually we will be, in some sense, that's, that's a crucial point. And the reason for this epsilon in the condition, uh, it should be some epsilon, uh, here is that uh, we need to, to bound from above the number of rotations. Because actually those rotations, uh, you look, you talked about movies, so you need to look at the in backward for, uh, fashion. Basically, we, we after, if you look at the result, after a number of rotations, we are after 120, 220 cycle. And if you look backwards, you, you will ask yourself uh, uh, how many cycles, how many, uh, how many passes or two factors yeah, uh, uh, at a distance. Sure, that's, that's for counts. Okay. Sure, I mean, uh, to prove, uh, to prove Hamiltonicity, you don't need number two. 
you just apply number one and number, number three. Okay, but uh, this is needed for, uh, for counting purposes. Okay, very good. So now we can formulate the result. And the result goes as follows. Uh, suppose uh, 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 we have an anti lambda graph. And again, anti lambda graph is a graph uh, for me, and for this result, is, is a graph which satisfies the expander mix and lemma. Once you get the expander mix and lemma, you can forget about regularity, eigenvalues. You just need some good grip on the edge distribution of the graph. Okay, and n is large enough. So here are the conditions. So the first condition is. Uh, the ratio d over lambda is at least as large as log n to the power 1 plus epsilon for some positive epsilon, which means we go a bit above the result of, of the existence of one Hamilton cycle, so we need a, a bit more. Second assumption is, is more painful, and, and it goes like this. If log d times of log d over lambda is much larger then log n. Okay. So that's a more meaningful condition. I'll interpret it in a minute. Now, what's the outcome of it? So the outcome is then the number of Hamilton cycles in our graph is equal to n factorial times d over n to the n. Okay. That's more or less works what we expect up to some polynomial corrections. And polynomial corrections are really negligible here. And uh, 1 plus a little of 1 to the n. So that's the main result. So the second condition really talks only about the result. Uh, okay, so now, now so let's, let's see what's, uh, well, the notion of large is, is relative. Right? So I, I, I would rather hope you would say the opposite thing. You can still get. <laughs> Correct, okay. So maybe let, let's try to interpret this. So as we said, lambda is at least as large as square root of d, and it, in, in quite a few cases, lambda is, at, is uh, at most d to the power 1 minus delta. So let's assume this. So if lambda is at most d to the power 1 minus delta for some positive delta, then the second condition translates to the following. The in this case, log d and log d over lambda are of the same order of magnitude, and we require that log d is much larger than square root of log n. So in other words, d is at least as large as 2 to the power omega of square root log n. So which still allows you for degrees which are sub-polynomial. Okay, sub it would be nice, of course, to extend it to, to smaller values of d and to say that even for degrees which are polylogarithmic, the result is still true. This I don't know what to do, but at least for the values which are polynomial or even subpolynomial, we know how to do this. <coughs> okay, so that's the result. Uh, now, uh, how much time I have? Uh, okay. So let me try to say f f a few words about the proof. Uh, okay, so up about. Okay, so upper bound, as uh, Noga has guessed, is relatively straightforward. What you do is, let's say, let's consider first the case when n is even, because then we can, we can have a perfect matching. So if n is even, so let me denote by mg number of perfect matchings in g. And then, because the number first is even, every Hamilton cycle is a union of two perfect matchings. I mean, the cycle in G is a union <coughs> two perfect matchings. And therefore, the number of Hamilton cycles is at most the number of pairs of perfect matchings. So therefore, H of G is at most M of G choose two. So if you know to bound M of G, you know to bound H of G as well. And for M of G, there is a relatively easy bound both in terms of its application and in terms of using it, in terms of proving it. So that's a result of uh, Noga and Schmiel Friedland, which I think has been proved before by Jeff and Lassie, but maybe it hasn't been published. Well, we'll see. 
think at least it's stated in your paper now, correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you. Yeah, you will recognize it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So suppose we have a graph G. Graph. And its degree sequence is d1 up to the n degree sequence. Then the number of perfect matchings is at most the product i goes from 1 to n di factorial to the power of 1 over di. OK, so for example, if you graph, if you substitute our condition about regularity, and that's exactly what you get. You need to square this result to get the bound on h of g, and that's, uh, this you get immediately. You can apply means directly, <coughs> maybe, yeah. That's a, an, an option, too. Yeah, you, 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 can, you can do means. It's, 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 it's. <coughs> yeah, well, here, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, here apply means as well, yes, okay. uh, correct. Yeah. Like for the Hamiltonian type? Yeah, 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 you, you can do it, yeah. That's, uh, that's not, not, a big, not a big deal. Okay, so a, a bigger deal is uh, to get some low bounds since I don't have much time, so let me try to wave my hands and to explain you something about it. Low bound. <coughs> so the idea would be that... Um, uh, we, we will need to do two things. We look, uh, uh, we don't know to count the number of Hamilton cycles uh, in a straightforward manner, but we know to count uh, the number of other structures which are relatively close to Hamilton cycles, and those are two factors. Okay? The idea is count two factors, <coughs> where by two factor I mean a collection of cycles which are vertically joined and, and which cover all the of the graph. And for technical reasons here, I allow cycles of length two as well. A single H is a cycle as well, which is fine. No, not a problem, okay? So we need to count two cycles. And for this, uh, of course, the standard technique is we need to look at the permanent and uh, to derive it from there. And we need to show that uh, the number of two factors with a relatively of course, you need to specify it with relatively few cycles. Is basically most of the mass. Okay, the number of two factors comes out to be n factorial divided by d of n uh, to the n, and we need to prove that most of those are with relatively few cycles. Now, relatively few here is something like n divided by poly log d, so it's not that few, so it's not that straightforward to prove. So basically, we get of this quantity by nice little form of n. Okay, and to the n, of course. n divided by poly log d, unfortunately, yeah, because that's the way to prove the result. Okay, now, now what's the next argument? So suppose you have a two-factor, so we know to rotate it. So how do we rotate it? We rotate it in the following way. That's also a pretty standard trick in papers about Hamiltonicity. is n over, n over poly log d, which should be, well, it's relatively few. Actually, the key to improving the result and to, to push it further is uh, this estimate. If you know to, to do it in a better way, then uh, you can improve the estimate. So, no, uh, so I believe it should be much smaller. I mean, normally, for example, if you take a random graph, a typical two factors of two factor is a logarithmic number of cycles. Because mm -hmm. the gap is really huge. It shouldn't be this. Okay, so suppose we have a two-factor. So what can we do with the two-factor? So we do the following thing. So we take, a, let's say, the first cycle. We don't need to order them. We, do, we take the first cycle. And let's assume that the graph is connected. So there's an edge sticking outside. It goes somewhere. Let's say it goes here. Yeah? So you open a path, okay? Now you go al along the second uh, cycle, okay? If there's any way to, to jump here, you jump, okay? And then you keep rotating. It can be the case that once you get to the final point, you cannot jump outside, okay? So you get a pass. And now you start rotating this pass. If you close this pass to a cycle, instead of having one, two, three cycles, you get one cycle, okay? And then I keep repeating this procedure. 
from a two factor with k cycles, you get two factor with uh, less than k cycles, you keep repeating it. By using rotation, eventually you arrive to Hamiltonians. So if you know how many cycles are in your construction and how many rotations it, it takes to merge two cycles into one, you know to estimate uh, how far you are from a cycle. Now it follows that uh, every two factor with, let's say, S cycles is at most S times the number of rotations, which was log n divided by log z over lambda, edges or rotations, which is the same, from a Hamilton cycle. Okay. You take a cycle, so you start merging, and each time you pay that many rotations, so now you get there. Okay. Now, and, and the point is because you have so many two factors, okay, and you can arrive to a Hamilton cycle from each of them so easily, so quickly, it cannot be the case that you have few Hamilton cycles. The number of Hamilton cycles should be large. Okay? <laughs> How large is this? So suppose you have a Hamilton cycle H, and then the number of two factors at distance uh, at most k from h. What is it? So you need to throw out k edges, which is n choose k. And then uh, by throwing k edges, you expose at most two k vertices. And for this two, two k vertices, you need to insert basically a perfect matching, okay? which gives you a rough estimate of d to the power 2k. Okay? Now, what do we get? So the final point will be like this. So the number of Hamilton cycles times this estimate for a properly chosen k, n choose k d to the power 2k, is all you get here. Because there are a lot of uh, two factors, and they have a relative few cycles, which is at least as large as n factorial d over n to the n times 1 minus little of 1 to the n. So you need to plug in the right value of k, you solve it for h of g, and that's how you get a lower bound on, uh, uh, on the number of uh, Hamilton cycles. And so the key of for, for doing it, uh, how do you prove that there are relative few cycles? Uh, uh, that's also a relative standard. I think Mogu used this in one of his papers, so we use it in, with our in one of our papers. How do you estimate the number of Hamilton cycles with many cycles, the number of two factors with many cycles? You first place this many cycles. Since there are many of them, quite a few of them are short, you place a short cycle first, and then you need to complement uh, this collection of short cycles by two factor in the rest. And because you have a handle on the edge distribution and you have uh, uh, Bregman means, you know to estimate the number of two factors in this remaining piece, and you plug it in and you know that it cannot be the case that most of your two factors are uh, with many cycles. A lot of them should be with a relatively few cycles. Okay. I'll stop here.